my privilege to welcome each and all to the morning worship service here at the Bremen Church of Christ. We're thankful for each of you's presence today. We'd ask you to please take a moment, fill out an attendance card, and pass that to the center aisle. We will collect that at the close of our service today. We have visitors with us. You're our honored guest, and we invite you back in each and every opportunity that you have to be with us. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock Sunday evening, 7 o'clock Wednesday for our midweek Bible study. Brother John McDaniel, our song leader, has selected number 203. 203 is our first song. If you wish to turn to that or be ready and watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother David Wilson will lead our minds in prayer. Sidney White will bring us the message of the hour, and Stephen Cooper will conclude our prayer or our uh, service in prayer this morning. Tonight is our potluck after the evening service to kick off the spring quarter, which begins today, today being the first day of our spring quarter. The potluck is after the evening worship service tonight, so we're looking forward to that fellowship. Make your plans to attend. Concerning those on our prayer list, Pam Wilkes had two stints put in last Thursday, and she is at home at this time and doing well, or better. At least Tomlin not feeling well and at home today. You're asked to remember our brother Tate Williams, who is now actually physically in Peru. He made it safely, and he's uh, preaching this morning at the congregation there in Iquitos, Peru. So far, he's doing well, and uh, his mom keeps up with him through Facebook, but he's doing great, so please remember him. Jeremy Overby asked that we remember him and his family. He has some difficult times that he's... Uh, Encountering, so he asked us to remember him and his family at this time. We're glad to see Brother and Sister Richard and Shirley Smallwood with us, who've been experiencing some health difficulties, but they're able to be out and about today, and we're glad to see that. As is Sister Barbara and Sister Frida, we're glad to see them too. Reba Carroll, however, is not feeling well and is at home this morning. If you lost a yellow earring, Joyce has found it. See her to retrieve that. We extend our sympathy to Aileen Brandon and her family in the passing of Brother Jimmy, the funeral last week. If you have yet to express your sympathies, we would ask you to do so. Congratulations to Ruth Tuggle, who has yet another great grandbaby. Number five, Tucker Gray Hannah, born last week, weighed seven pounds, 15 ounces. Congratulations to her. Also, congratulations to Ashlyn Hodges and her friend Lindy Dewberry. Her uh, 9 and 10 year old Recreation League uh, basketball team won the state championship yesterday, so congratulations to them. Are there others that we should mention? The uh, food truck in the children's home will be here tomorrow. We do have several items that you see in the box in the foyer, but if you have some last-minute items, I'm sure they would be happy to retrieve those. Teachers, from last quarter, if you have yet to turn in your perfect attendance information, please do that to Jimmy or Jan. That's scheduled to be presented next Sunday. There's a gospel meeting that concludes today at the Waco Congregation. Brother B.J. Clark, their final service will be at 1 o'clock this afternoon. 1 o'clock this afternoon, final service at Waco with Brother B.J. Clark. Also, a gospel meeting beginning today at the West Georgia Congregation. Brother Ken Thomas, the speaker, today through Thursday. More information about that on the bulletin board here in the hallway. Would you bow with me, please? Kind Father, we're thankful for the many blessings of life. We're thankful that we have this opportunity today to meet with those of like precious faith. We're thankful for the measure of health that we enjoy that allows us to be here. Father, may we focus on our task today and worship Thee in spirit and in truth, dismiss those things of a worldly nature from our mind so that we may worship Thee acceptably. Forgive us of anything amiss in our lives, Father, so that You may see us robed in white and You may receive our worship. For those that have a public part in leading us today, be with them. Father, we're mindful of several that we've mentioned specifically this morning. We're thankful for the answered prayer that's evident among us today. Continue to watch over and care for us, Father, and forgive us when we fail thee. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship now and stand and sing number 203. Soldiers of
seated, please. <clears throat> Before the Lord's Supper this morning, number 447, 447. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, how can we express our gratitude for such a gift as this? That you were willing to send and he was willing to come to be our sacrificial atoning lamb for our sins and not his. Father, the things that he experienced that day was for our behalf that we could have hope in life eternal. But, Father, we're eternally sorrowful that he had to experience those things. Father, this bread represents his body, and by his stripes we are healed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we overlooked anyone that's serving of the bread? Dear God, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which to the Christian represents the blood that flowed from Calvary's cross. As we partake of this, may our minds go back to the scene of the cross and remember the awful and the terrible death of Jesus as he gave himself for our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If we overlooked anyone, if you'll raise your hand, we'll come back at this time. This concludes the Lord's Supper. We have also been commanded to lay by in store as we've been prospered. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we do have so many things to give thanks to you for, the spiritual blessings that are only found in your Son. We also give thanks for our ability to earn a living, for we know that you have placed this in our hands. Father, as we prepare this day to give back to you, we're grateful for the ability to earn, and we pray that the money will be collected today will further your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
160. 160. Sing verses 1 and 3. O oh, heart bowed down with sorrow, O oh, eyes that long for sight, there's gladness and believing in Jesus, there is For our prayer, number 110. 110. <clears throat> Again, we'll sing verses 1 and 3. When peace like a river attendeth my
bow with me, please? Our most gracious, kind, and loving Heavenly Father, as we humbly, dear Lord, come before Thee in prayer at this time, we're thankful, dear Lord, for sparing our lives one more day so that if anything is amiss in our lives, dear Lord, we will correct that. So that we, dear fathers, we may stand clean and pure before thee when that time and moment is at hand, we can hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We pray, dear Lord, that each of us here this morning are here for the right reasons to give homage to thee, dear Father. To listen to another portion of thy loved word, beloved word, dear Lord, that is for each of us here, dear Father. May we as many here this morning, dear Lord, act as one, as you have so directed us from the beginning of time, that no matter where we venture, dear Father, from this place, that you are there and we are there as one. We are, dear Lord, though human, and we're thankful, dear God, for your love for us that allows us to repent of that sin, dear Father. We love you, dear Lord. And wish to serve you and you only. We're thankful, dear Father, for our answered prayers. We're thankful, dear Lord, for allowing our loved ones that were sick to be back with us. We ask, dear Lord, that we extend a comforting hand to our loved ones that have lost loved ones. May we let them know, dear Lord, that they're special and that even though we may not give them the attention that they deserve at that time, that they will know that we care, dear Father. We pray especially, dear Father, for the ones that have said, I accept thee, Lord, as my Lord and Savior, and have turned their ways from that, dear Father. May someone here, someone can touch their hearts, dear Lord, to make things right. We pray especially, dear Father, again for our, our sons and daughters and our men and women they have chosen, dear Father, to serve in the military. We pray, dear God, that you will help them to stay strong with thee, that you will guide them, dear Father. We're thankful, dear Lord, for thy word and what it means to each of us. We pray, dear Lord, as we open thy word this day, this morning, dear Lord, in reverence to thee, that the things that we do and say here are in accordance to thy word, that we will apply these to our lives, dear Lord, that we might be an even stronger servant for thee. We ask now, dear Father, as we continue with our lives, that you help keep us in check through thy word, dear Lord that in the end, dear Father, we can look forward to being with thee in heaven. All these things now we humbly pray in your Son's name, Jesus. Amen. The invitation song this morning will be number 259, 259. And before the lesson, number 618, 618. On Zion's glorious summit stood. Let's stand as we sing verses 1 and 3 before our lesson this morning. And the song two's portion at the bottom of the page. 
Let's all sing out together. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host free thy blood. They came to their king in strange divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to encourage you to be turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. I want us to review just briefly and then continue a study that we began last Lord's Day based on some thoughts from this section of Scripture. Matthew chapter 13. While you're turning there, it is good to see each of you here. We do have several visitors today, and we are extremely grateful that you have chosen to be here. And we hope that you'll have other opportunities to visit with us from time to time as you are in the area. Beginning in verse 10 of Matthew 13, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall it be given. He shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. We raised the question in our study last week, and it's a question that we often ask ourselves, as we study with those and we're trying to make an effort to 
convert folks who are outside of Christ where they can have a relationship with God and we, we make various points and then we raise the question, why can't they see that? And so we raised a number of points in our study last week. Why can't they see that baptism is necessary? And we quoted some verses in that regard. We raised the question, why can't they see that salvation is not by faith only? As a matter of fact, we noted from James chapter 2, the only time that the phrase faith only appears, it is preceded by the word not. Why can't they see that? We noted as well that we try to teach that there's only one church. Jesus said upon this rock, I will build my church, singular. There's one body, Ephesians chapter 4. It's the church, Ephesians chapter 1. Why can't people see that? Why can't people see that the use of mechanical instrument of music is wrong in our worship to God? Yes, we believe in music, but God was specific in the kind that He chose. And that was vocal, not instrumental. Why can't people see that one is lost outside the church, the body of Christ? In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, He's the Savior of the body. He's not promised to save anything else. Why can't people see that? But there's another interesting question that I want us to raise in the same regard, as we look at people that, that we try to teach and we try to emphasize these things to them and, and they don't see them and we raise that question, why can't they see that? It appears so simple. The next question I want to raise is, why can't we see some things? In our study last week, as we raised those various questions, we went back to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15. Now obviously this verse does not apply to everybody. But when the Bible is so plain and simple on certain subjects, why is it that we can't see? Could it be the same reason for those people not being able to see those things that we can't see some things that we ought to be seeing? For example, why can't we see? the need to teach those who are outside the body of Christ. The Great Commission, according to Matthew's account, says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even in the world. Or Mark's account says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. And yet when we look at these passages, we see the responsibility we have. And at the same time, we realize that there are so many who are members of the body of Christ who are not doing this. We raise the same question. Why can't we see that? That it is an individual responsibility Peter, Paul, rather, for example, in, in writing to Timothy, talked about the church. Well, when you talk about the church, you're talking about people. But the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The church is the very support of the truth. And if we don't get the message out there, then who's going to get it out there? The answer is nobody. Now, there are those who will attempt to get certain parts of it out there, but in some cases, they even get that confused with truth. So there is a responsibility that we teach and that we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's not a command for just a select few. In Acts chapter 8, when the persecution came upon the church and Saul of Tarsus being the instigator of much of that, we're told in verse 4 that they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. It's interesting in that context that the disciples stayed there. They were not scattered. And so they that were scattered abroad would be a reference to those who had already been converted to Christ who were receiving the brunt of the persecution and went into other parts of the world. But they did not quit teaching the Word of God just because of that persecution. 
and so the command to teach. Paul would say to the young evangelist Timothy, The things which thou hast heard of me among witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, that they may be able to teach others also. That's how the gospel is carried on. From generation to generation, those who know the gospel, teaching it to others. That's how people are converted to Christ. Those who know the gospel, teaching it to those who have not yet heard it or have obeyed it. So could we go right back to Matthew chapter 13 and verse 15? Why can't we see that we as individual Christians need to be preaching and teaching the gospel of Christ to the lost? Could it be that our heart is waxed gross? Could it be that our ears are dull of hearing and in our eyes we have closed? lest we see and understand what God wants us to do and then would of necessity be busy doing that. Why can't we see? Why can't we see the need to help those who are in need? And again, as I suggested at the outset, all of these things do not apply to everybody. But there are those within the body of Christ who seemingly do not understand the need and the responsibility to help where help is needed. Quite honestly, in this congregation, I think you've been very gracious in times past of opportunities to, to help those in need. You've, you seem to always come through in flying colors, but, but that's not always the case. In James chapter 1, James says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And, and the word visit there is more than just a drop by, hello, how are you? The word visit there literally means to inspect with the intent of helping. And so we visit those who are fatherless. We visit those who are in need. And our purpose is to, to see what those needs are and then to see what we can do to alleviate that need. So in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul would write, As ye therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. There is a primary and a secondary responsibility, but both phrases involve responsibility. Those who are the household of faith, especially those, but do good to all men. So there's that kind of a dual responsibility in that regard to help those who are in need. You remember the picture of the judgment scene that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 25? When all nations shall be gathered before Him, and He'll say to those on the right hand, Come, and, and then His explanation is... I was hungry, you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was sick, I was in prison. You, you ministered to me those things that were needful, Lord. When did we see you like that? Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, you've done it unto me. What had they done? They had helped those in need. James discusses somewhat the opposite side of that in James chapter 2. Someone comes to you in need, and, and you simply say to them, Be ye warned and filled. Nevertheless, you don't provide for them the things they need. Where's the benefit? Where's the help? It's not there. And James, in that context, makes it very clear that to those who show no mercy, no mercy will be shown. And so we have a responsibility as children of God. Wherever there's an opportunity to help those who are in need. If that's not been our case, then we raise the same question. Why can't we see? Those important principles involved in that. Why can't we see? The need to study God's Word. <coughs> if I were to ask this morning, with no expectation of your answering, obviously, before Bible class this morning, when was the last time you opened your Bible? What would your answer have been? How much time do we really put into a study of the Word of God? 
Obviously, none of us have, have even come close to knowing all there is to know about it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter said to those to whom he is writing, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, for what purpose? That you may grow thereby. There's always room for growth. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, probably the more familiar passage to us, in that regard, Paul said, study. Literally there, give diligence. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Quite honestly, so much of the religious confusion that exists in our world today is simply because people do not know how to rightly divide the word of truth. So they don't know if we're under the Old Testament or the New Testament or under both and mix and match or whatever. They just simply don't know. But when we learn to rightly divide the word of truth, then we can make the proper application in that regard. But we're to give diligence to show that we are approved of God in that regard. Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews writer talked about those who had been in the church long enough, for when for the time you ought to be teachers. Ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Or I think of Peter's statement again in 2 Peter chapter 3 and in verse 18, when he said, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That requires study on our part. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter would write, Among those things that we're to add, add to our faith virtue to virtue, knowledge. That takes study on our part. But how much time do we really spend in a study of the Word of God? That's something that each of us needs to think about in our own lives. And, and you might say, well, look, I study my Bible every day. That's great. That's great. But how much more could we do if we really desired to know more of the Word of God? And I often think of the passage within the Beatitudes, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, in which Jesus said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Righteousness is found within the Word of God. Romans 1, Paul talked about the Gospel, verse 16. Then in verse 17, he said, For therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed. And so if we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, then it's obvious we're going to be spending some time with the book, isn't it? And so our desire to know more of the Word of God, that's an everyday thing. So if we're not studying like we ought to, neglecting God's Word, why can't we see that there is this responsibility placed upon us by God Himself to come to a greater knowledge of His will for us? This question is probably as pertinent as any. When we think about all of the departures from the faith that are taking place among our own brethren, why can we not see the importance of worshiping in the right way? The right way or by the right way, I simply mean, as, as John said in John 4, 23 and 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. To worship God correctly or in the right way involves two things according to that verse. First of all, there's the right spirit. The word spirit there simply suggests disposition or attitude. When we come to worship, there is an attitude that we must possess. And that could be a rather lengthy study in itself. But, but you'll remember Jesus said on one occasion, if, if you bring your gift to the altar and understand the time period there, that was before New Testament church was established and New Testament worship was in place, 
But the principle is still the same. If you bring your gift to the altar and remember that thy brother hath ought against thee, go to him, tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Now what do you say in the midst of that? Leave your gift there. Don't attempt to worship God when there is aught with a brother or sister, as the case may be. How can our attitude be what it ought to be if there's aught involved, if, if something is wrong among brethren? We need to resolve that. Then we can come and worship with the right attitude. David mentioned in his prayer a moment ago the, the idea of homage, reverence, respect that we give to God by our coming together. And if we come together with any other attitude or disposition, then it's wrong. We often hear people talk about, especially with reference to the Lord's Supper, let, let's clear our minds of those things of the world and nature and Focus in on the Lord's Supper, and that's well and good. I'm not belittling that. But we should have done that before we ever walked in the door to try to worship to start with. We need to clear our minds of the things of the world when we're singing, when we're praying, when we're giving, when we're studying the Lord's Supper, when we're studying the Word of God. We need to get things of the world out of our minds. That's the right attitude. That's the right disposition. But he also says worship in truth. That's according to God's will. God has set forth in the Scripture, and we, we talk about this from time to time, those items of worship, and some people frown on the use of that terminology. But God has specified certain things that are acts of worship, things that we are to do to properly repay that homage, or, or pay that homage and respect to Him. Singing, praying, Partaking of the Lord's Supper. Partaking of the Lord's Supper and then the giving. And I like the way it's done here. There's a distinction made between the two. I think in a lot of places folks don't understand that the Lord's Supper ends and then the contribution begins. Those are two different acts, two different things that we have the responsibility to do. And it's always made very clear here to that end. The study of God's Word. Those are things that God has designated as acts by which we pay our homage and respect to Him. But yet folks come along and they want to add to that. They want to do things and call it worship that, that they like to do. That's usually where the mechanical instrument comes in. God's very specific about the kind of music He, he wants in worship. We don't have the right to add anything to that even though we may like it greatly. So why can't we see? Why are there so many people just, just splintering off in every direction over doctrinal matters? It should not be that way. Paul said that we all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among us. And when we stick with the gospel, we'll speak with the same thing. When we begin to add to it or take from it, then the division comes. Why can't we see the need to worship God in spirit and in truth. Why can't we see the need to assemble with the saints at every opportunity? And of course, Hebrews 10, 25, 29, 30 are passages that are often used. Not forsaking the assembling, and as the original would suggest there, the coming together of the saints. That's not a reference just to Sunday morning, as some people would have us believe. Not forsaking or don't forsake the, the coming together of yourself. He didn't specify when. Now we know we have the command to, to assemble on the first day of the week to worship God, to partake of the Lord's Supper, but there may be other times as well. Is it any less important to come together, to assemble together, to study together, to pray together, to enjoy the fellowship together at other times as well? But it seems that some people have what we might call the Brill cream complex. A little dab will do you. And if you're young, you don't understand that. If you're older, you do. But that seems to be the attitude of a lot of people. Just a little dab will do me. So they don't bother to come back Sunday night. They don't bother to come back Wednesday night. And yet there's the responsibility, not forsaking the assembly. Some in the day when Hebrews was written were doing just that, as the manner of some is but exhorting one another as much the more 
as you see the day approaching. Why can we not see the importance of praying on a regular basis? Prayer has been described as our, our lifeline to God. There may be some quibble about that, but still. <clears throat> God has provided a way for us to approach Him, to talk to Him. He talks to us through His Word. We have the privilege of talking to Him through Jesus Christ, through prayer. And so Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, pray without ceasing. Now that doesn't mean that we go around verbalizing prayer all the time. If we did, we'd never get anything else done. But the idea involved there is a prayerful attitude. We ought never to be engaged in anything concerning which we cannot add God's blessing. And that would change the lifestyle of a lot of folks. Pray without ceasing. So important that we remember our relationship to God. And so we need to pray on a regular basis. Why can't we see the need to control the tongue? James chapter 3, almost an entire chapter dealing with the responsibility and the deadly nature of an uncontrolled tongue. We've seen so much in our study on Wednesday evenings and here at least in the study of Proverbs how often there is mention of the whisperer, the, the tell-bearer, the, the gossiper, the one who slanders. There's so much about the, the tongue and the lips and the mouth within the Proverbs to suggest to us that that it is a major problem or God would not have spent so much time in His Word dwelling on it. And oftentimes it is the case we give little thought to what we say or little thought to how we say it. And you know, both of those things are important. Paul wrote, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. We need to be careful how we say what we say. As a matter of fact, if you study through the New Testament and you do a word study of the word edify in all of its various forms, edify, edification, so forth, the thing that you find is that whatever comes out of the mouth ought to be unto edifying. And if our speech is not so characterized, then we've got speech coming out of our mouth that ought not to be coming out. Need to put a bridle on that tongue. Need to give careful thought to how we say, what we say in that regard and other passages that are mentioned there in that regard. Why can't we see that a child of God can be lost? You know, oftentimes the accusation is made against the churches of Christ. Y'all think y'all are the only ones going to heaven. I'll tell you something, not all of us are going to heaven. And I don't mean that us in the sense of just this assembly this morning. I'm talking about those who are members of the body of Christ. Not all of us are going to make it to heaven. Jesus explains as clearly as anybody can who's going to make it to heaven, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. That's who's going to heaven. Those who do the will of the Father. And so, so Paul would write in, in the Galatian letter chapter 5 about those who seek to be justified by the law. He said, you're fallen from grace. People tell you every day, you can't fall from grace. Peter said those people had fallen from grace. In the early part of the Galatian letter, chapter 1, Paul would write, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. And he repeated that in the very next verse. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Paul would warn, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Now, if it's impossible to fall, why would Paul even write such a verse? <coughs> Take heed lest you fall. It is possible that a child of God can be lost. But yet oftentimes we live our lives as if that were not the case. Why can't we see that? 
And then why do we not make the adjustments in our lives where we will not ultimately be lost as children of God? So my thought in all of that is, and I've got some other points, uh, practice church discipline, but other matters, and you can just keep on listing things in that regard. But when we begin to ask people, or ask ourselves concerning other people, why can't they see? Maybe we need to back up and look at ourselves and say, why can't we see? Have our eyes been closed? Have our ears become dull of hearing of, of the Word of God in responsibilities that we have? The answer could be the same, couldn't it? Why can't they see? Why can't we see? Probably very little difference in the answer to those two questions. I hope these thoughts will prompt you to to examine yourself, and that's what Paul encourages us to do, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Am I really listening to the Word of God? Am I really looking at the Word of God? Am I really understanding what it is that God wants me to do? Or I'd rather not go there. It could be that you're in the audience this morning and you've never been baptized into Christ. There's no salvation outside of Christ. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ. You're not children of God outside of Christ. You're children of God in Christ. How do we get into Christ? Know you not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ? Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27. So if your faith in Jesus Christ would lead you to turn away from sin, confess that faith, you can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk in newness of life. As a child of God, have you asked that question, why can't they see, but at the same time realize that, that there are things lacking in my life, things lacking in your life that maybe I'm not seeing so clearly either. So maybe I need to back up and look at myself, get things in my life in order, and then be in a better position to help those who are outside of Christ. You'll ask God's forgiveness of negligence as a child of God. As you confess wrong and turn from it, He'll forgive. And this morning, and if we can help you in either of these regards, we'd be delighted to do it as we stand together and sing the song of invitation.
The invitation song this morning, or sorry, the closing song this morning will be number 215, 215. We'll sing verses, first and last verses of that song, and then be led in a closing prayer. After the closing prayer, we ask that you be seated for a special announcement. As soon as we uh, conclude that prayer. Uh, also, please pass your cards to the center aisle to be picked up as we sing this song, then our prayer, and then our, the announcement. There is a habitation built by the living God for all of every nation who is sick at and abode. On Zion, Zion, I long thy gates to Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you again for another first day of the week that you have blessed us with to come and study another portion of your word, sing songs of praise unto you. Pray that all things said and done here today has been pleasing and according to your will. We pray that you will bless those who request the prayers of the church this time. Pray that you will be with us as we depart from this building. Forgive us where we sin and keep us safe. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>